like about Squirrel Hill is that it's still a community. It's still a place where people come when they want to come home. You can't walk down the street without knowing somebody through somebody else. I just like the people, I like the place. Squirrel Hill is Pittsburgh's largest neighborhood, and it's a study in contrast. Stately mansions sit alongside apartments. It is bursting with students and seniors. It is the heart of the Jewish community, but is also the most ethnically diverse area in all of Pittsburgh. People-wise, it's like a melting pot. If you come early in the morning and look at a bus stop, you'll see a little bit of everybody and everybody gets along. What you're seeing is a whole new group of people coming from all over the world, and this is their Ellis Island. And it's a model for what urban communities should be. I can walk 10 minutes, and I have restaurants, banks, movies, or I walk five minutes, and I'm basically in the forest. We're standing here at the corner of Forbes and Murray Avenues, which to those of us who live here is the center of the universe. You have a book card. Have a in great fact, day. there's so much to see and do, but here is Squirrel Hill in a nutshell. Hey, how are you? Good. I was born on Phillips Avenue, which is right up the street from Minio's and Aiello's, and Napoli's is a little further up. So, when I was a kid, every morning I'd, you know, for lunchtime you'd you'd have 65 cents in your pocket and you could get a slice of pizza. Corey O'Connor is a familiar face in Squirrel Hill, a neighborhood so large it actually has two city council representatives. It's not surprising that Corey is one of them, considering his genes. My dad, Bob, was obviously the, the late mayor of the city and 20 years to the day that I took office, he was the councilman in the same district. He taught me everything I know about politics and how to work with people. He and I would walk up and down the streets and he would say hello to everybody. What's going good on? He's a father, he's a good son. <laughs> yes, our, our district is very diverse. You walk down the street and you hear five, six different languages. And there are very few places, I think, in, in Pittsburgh where you have that kind of diversity. And, and I enjoy that. It's part of what makes Squirrel Hill really unique from other parts of Pittsburgh. This, this is a great constituent base here. I mean, they will tell me what's going on, what's right, what's wrong, and, and that's the good thing. Our clientele's from all four corners of the so Corey listens. Let me lobby you on something here. Yep. And so does Bill Peduto, Squirrel Hill's other city councilman. Many afternoons you can find him at his unofficial office, Coffee Tree Roasters on Forbes Avenue. Yeah, Bloomfield on one side, Squirrel Hill on the other, and everything in between. It's like a big club sandwich with focaccia on one side and rye on the other. And it really is where you're starting to see this whole new Pittsburgh emerge. In the last 10 years, the only area of the city that has grown is the area that I get to represent. And it has increased by 10%. Nationally, you're seeing people want to move back into cities and wanting to have this type of a city environment. Squirrel Hill is blessed with an abundance of good things. And it isn't just because it was given to them. It was planned out well, and then generation after generation has enhanced it. Steve Hawkins is one of those people making Squirrel Hill better. He's a past president of the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition, a citizens-based organization that works to improve the lives of the 26,000 people who live here. The population of the 14th Ward is a mix. Most of the people are white about 82 percent and the rest are uh, the, the next biggest uh, group are Asians probably due to the proximity of Squirrel Hill to the universities and the medical facilities in Oakland and nearby and then African Americans and others including Hispanics. In addition to serving on the coalition board Steve is an architect who lives and works here. There are neighborhoods uh, being designed and towns being designed all over the country trying to emulate the characteristics that we have right here in Squirrel Hill. We have uh, a fairly dense commercial district and beyond that uh, plenty of residences within walking distance and we're very fortunate to be sandwiched in between the two major city parks, Frick Park and Shenley Park. So there's recreation there, access to everywhere, it's a walkable neighborhood, uh, just very comfortable. To celebrate these things, the Urban Coalition has begun officially designating places and people as Squirrel Hill treasures. Last year we recognized the intersection where we are right now, Forbes and Murray, 
as a Squirrel Hill treasure because it really is the center of the universe to us. In 2012, one of the chosen treasures is the Squirrel Hill branch of the Carnegie Library. It shares its 40th birthday with the coalition, and like the coalition, it was born of local residents wanting to improve their community. There was a political battle in terms of whether there should be a library in, in Squirrel Hill, and it really was a citizen you know, uprising really to have the library here. They formed petitions and committees and there was this sense that, well, why would people even come to Squirrel Hill Library since we have the main library in Oakland so close by? But ever since we've opened, we've been the biggest um, use outside of Oakland in, in, in terms of the entire city systems. I think it says a lot about what this neighborhood is about. I mean, it's such a close-knit community in terms of family and it's a highly literate community. So people bring their babies and they get them library cards after two weeks old or two months old. and we are the most used in the entire Carnegie Library system in terms of our children's area, and that means we circulate more materials, we have more people coming into programs, um, we have more people just walking into the door to use our children's area than any other library in the city. Another urban coalition treasure is the Manor Theater, just around the corner from the library on Murray Avenue. Over the years, thousands of youngsters spent their Saturdays watching cartoons and serials at this grand old movie house. We just celebrated our 90th anniversary, so I think it's currently the oldest consistently running business in Squirrel Hill. It opened on May 15, 1922. My father, Ernest, and my cousin, George, took over the ownership of the Manor Theater in the mid-70s and during that time they renovated the theater and uh, converted it from a single screen to a twin. The family sold the manor in 1989, but Rick Stern was reeled back in. And then in 1992, I took back ownership personally of the theater and renovated the theater and converted it from its uh, twin configuration to its current fourplex. To stay competitive in this era of giant theater chains, the manor recently underwent yet another renovation. You can now have a drink and fancy nosh while sitting in cushy seats. Returning to Pittsburgh to help oversee the construction and changes was Rick's daughter, Alexa. So I grew up with my, my dad and my grandfather in this business. She grew up with, with me and uh, in this business. So it's, it's kind of like a family tradition. While the manor may be one of Squirrel Hill's oldest institutions, at the other end of the neighborhood is one of its newest. Somerset Development is eventually going to have about 700 units of various sorts, from apartments to single-family homes. It was a slag heap for the steel mills down below, and sometime 15, 20 years ago, to its credit, the, uh, the city government began to explore whether there could be a brownfield development of that site. And that has been a significant addition to the community. To Michael Ehrman, the development of Somerset is a link in the expansion of Squirrel Hill. Empty land becomes a thriving community. It's how Squirrel Hill got its start. There was a certain amount of scattered dwelling here, probably around this, uh, the late 18th century, about the same time as uh, you know, the, the British took over Fort Duquesne. Michael is chairman of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, another citizens group that meets monthly and has published a history of the neighborhood. Squirrel Hill stayed unsettled longer than a lot of the neighborhoods around here because it was up on the hill. It was not near what was the basis of settlement in those days, which were the rivers. A change from Native American to a fair number of farms in the 19th century. Sometime in the mid to late 19th century, Squirrel Hill went through two or three phases of change fairly quickly. First of all, a number of estates were established. Notably, members of the Mellon family were particularly active in settling both here and neighboring Shadyside. Also in the late 19th century, however, some more urban things started because a trolley was opened up along Forbes Avenue. By the 1920s and 30s, the wealthy families began selling off their land. They subdivided and, and ultimately replaced their own mansions. They felt that it was more valuable to get the proceeds. As, as Pittsburgh 
was expanding up the hill or as there was an openness now with the trolley. You can still see remnants of those grand mansions like the Worthington Mansion that's now part of Temple Sinai, a Jewish congregation on Forbes Avenue, or Mellon Hall on the campus of Chatham College. And as the wealthy families left, the middle class and immigrants began moving in, including some who would go on to fame of their own. Gene Kelly had his studios here. Willa Cather, the author, lived on Murray Hill Avenue for a while. You ever go on a boat? Does it go like this? More recent and well-beloved resident of Squirrel Hill for much, not all of his life, was Fred Rogers. There are lots of things to wonder about in this world. I teach the American Jewish experience at Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh. And um, I'm writing about the Pittsburgh Jewish community. Barbara Burston explains how Squirrel Hill became an epicenter for Jewish life and how they came to Pittsburgh in the first place. So by 1864, you had some Jews that had come from Prussia, eastern areas of Germany. As they became more established, more comfortable, they moved into Allegheny City, which today is the North Shore. Beginning in the 1870s, you had Jews from Eastern Europe, from Russia, from Poland, who were really impoverished and coming here. And they basically got off the train station at, and walked to the hill. When Squirrel Hill began experiencing a growth in population at the turn of the 20th century, both Jewish groups took note. Beginning in the 1920s, certainly, they talk about an exodus off the hill into Squirrel Hill. You had a great deal of construction. You not only had Beth Sholem, the sanctuary we're sitting in, uh, this building began in 1922. You also had Polizetic that moved from the hill to Squirrel Hill by 1928. By the 1940s, most Jewish institutions were centered in Squirrel Hill, and more Jews continued to pour in. Holocaust survivors arrived in the late 40s and 50s. During the 1970s, there was another influx. The Russians now were coming, totally different group, fleeing the Soviet regime in the late 1970s, 1980s. At one point, I understand there was something like 20 kosher butcher shops along Murray Avenue, Jewish bakeries, bagel stores. It certainly appeared as if it was overwhelmingly Jewish, but it really, in fact, was not. From what I understand, no more than 40% was Jewish. Hello, good card with a great map. But that community has made its presence day. felt. I have in the last few years given out over 65,000 cards. Helping Squirrel Hill retain that Jewish flavor are people like Miriam Rosenblum. She can usually be found outside the giant eagle passing out the good card. This is the good card and that actually paraphrases what the Rebbe said, that every act of kindness and goodness does count. Mrs. Rosenblum is a member of the Lubavitch Jewish community, which has a large presence in Squirrel Hill. But there are Jewish institutions, synagogues, schools, stores, social service agencies of all types in this neighborhood. Shlomo Perlman is a part of it all. I'm an owner of uh, Pinsker Judaica Center, along with my wife, Hannah. Uh, right now we're in the uh, wine room. Uh, it's been expanded recently to accommodate an explosion of kosher wines that has happened over the last five to ten years. You can find anything you need to lead a Jewish lifestyle at the store, which opened back in 1954. Well, the mezuzah that goes out on the door, a wine cup that we call a Kiddush cup, which we use to sanctify the Shabbat and also holidays, a talus that we wear during prayers, things like that which are specifically tied to mitzvot, commandments, we sell these. We just got in from Florida, lived here all my life, and, and you came to Pinsker. I came to Pinsker. This is my first stop after the, the dirty O. <laughs> Non-Jews come to this Murray Avenue institution too. We have uh, regularly busloads of non-Jewish students, high school students, mostly from Catholic schools, who come as a field trip to Squirrel Hill to see the Jewish community. And one of their main stops is Pinsker's. Mm -hmm. 
They also visit Murray Avenue Kosher, Squirrel Hill's only kosher food store, or Moshe Pakar, the silversmith on Lower Murray Avenue. Or they come to the largest presence of all, the Jewish Community Center with its distinctive Hebrew lettered clock on the tower. Take your hand and pull it this way and it will do wonderful, magical things. It'll give the painting the energy. There is nothing you can't do, but you've got to know you cannot be afraid of it. These are students at Lila Hirsch Brody's Acrylic Art Class, one of the many programs the JCC offers. Ta-da! I've been with the Jewish Community Center for 36 years. I teach on Wednesday. As you see, I have a fabulous class of people. These people come from all walks of life, all religions, all races, and they are welcome. What's to be afraid of? All you have to do is smear it out, get white again, it's not a life. If you look back at our history for the 100 years, you'll see back when we were in the Hill District, we were serving the whole community as well. But as Squirrel Hill has diversified, um, our agency has diversified with that. JCC President Brian Schreiber says that while the majority of the center's membership is Jewish, its facilities are used by the entire neighborhood. The JCC is a multifaceted social, human service, recreational, social agency. We call it Babies to Bubbies. We are both the Jewish epicenter of the community and also a community center for the neighborhood of Squirrel Hill. And that's something that's evolved over time. Within our early childhood program, we have 20 different languages spoken and almost 50% of the children in the early childhood program, English is not their first language, their parents' first language. That reflects the changing face of Squirrel Hill, a neighborhood that is once again in transition. The butcher shops are gone. The delicatessens are basically gone. Many of the smaller businesses that are owned by Jews are gone. And what's left is a much more multicultural neighborhood that has been influenced a lot by CMU and Pitt, the students. It's still identified as Jewish, but from a practical point of view, walk, driving up and down or walking up and down the street, uh, its Jewishness has been um, uh, lessened significantly just visually. Murray Avenue has become in Pittsburgh the either Shagas, the Jewish street. Well, 30 years ago, I did a movie called Murray Avenue, A Community in Transition. And now I'm looking at it 30 years later. Murray Avenue is really a different street. My original thought was, oh, it hasn't changed that much. And in some ways, it really hasn't. But in many ways, it really has. Sheila Shamovitz is a Pittsburgh filmmaker who has watched her community evolve. First, it, it went from Jewish, from kosher butcher shops to Italian uh, pizzerias. And then it went from Italian pizzerias to Asian restaurants. So it has, it's kind, it's changing its character and in many ways it's she she up. That's evident in the variety of stores and restaurants up and down the commercial corridor. Mike Wu and his family own several Asian restaurants on Murray and Forbes and are leaders in the explosion of Asian owned businesses. Me and my family, we've been here for almost 20 years. Um, just recently we just started to open a lot more, uh, kind of expanding in this area. Mike grew up in Squirrel Hill, moved away, and then came back to help run the family business. He says the growing Asian population has increased the demand for Asian restaurants, bakeries, and stores. I think it's you know the increase of uh, recruitment uh, by the universities and the colleges nearby it attracts other Asian families to move in as well. So over time, I think uh, the Asian population is going to grow by quite a bit. Jean-Pierre Nutini serves another growing Squirrel Hill presence, the Hispanic community. He and his wife Lisa own Mexico Lindo, which carries Mexican arts and crafts. The Latino community has always had quite a bit of influx into the Squirrel Hill area because of the hospitals, the universities, as well as the uh, Pittsburgh Symphony, the ballet, the opera. The latest influx of Mexican population 
doesn't necessarily live in this area, although they do work here in every store along Murray and Forbes cor corridor can be found to be manned by Mexican chefs, cooks, dishwashers, and waiters. They don't so much live in Squirrel Hill as they do work in Squirrel Hill because they can't afford it yet. While Mexico Lindo is part of the evolving Squirrel Hill landscape, just across the street is a remnant of the old, the Murray Avenue newsstand, which seems suspended in time. I bought this store 31 years ago off Eddie Millstone, who was here for 32 years. So the store has been here for about 63 years. Well, when I bought the store, it was more of a, it was a newspaper store and toys. The Sunday morning, we would move 1,200 newspapers out of the store. Now, if we move 75 to 100, it's a lot. Right. Some winners? Yeah. We're mainly lottery, Western Union, bill paying, and we still do some toys, but not like it was 20 years ago. Mark's had to adapt to stay in business, and so has Bill Swoop. The most competitive coffee market in the city of Pittsburgh is Squirrel Hill for sure. There are more than a half dozen coffee houses lining Forbes and Murray Avenues. I had always heard that Pittsburgh was the highest consumption per capita of coffee in the world. But Bill has an edge. He and his dad own Squirrel Hill's oldest coffee house. My father and I together started the Coffee Tree Roasters in our Squirrel Hill location was our first and it opened in July 3rd, 1993. We were looking for a good cross-section of, of people as far as density and we really like the walking traffic here. Fresh roast. You'll find many unique things in Squirrel Hill, not only places, but people. People like Kimberly Fought. I like to call myself the Squirrel Hill Gypsy Violinist. When I was very tiny, we lived in Iran. We then lived for about nine years in Italy, and we've traveled a lot, and I love, love, love gypsy music. I really love my little spot here at the manor. It's my stage, and the acoustics are great. <laughs> And there's Mo, the crossing guard, who's been at the corner of Forbes and Murray for years. I lived here 20 years, know all the people, worked for Rite Aid as well, <laughs> community person. Just up the street from Mo's busy corner is another Squirrel Hill landmark. This is my family shoe store. My dad's owned it about 29 years now. The store's 100 years old. A visit to Squirrel Hill isn't complete without a trip to one of its destination stores, and Littles really foots the bill. There was a Littles family that started Littles where it got its name. It actually used to be around the corner on Murray Avenue, and uh, at some point moved up here. We've got a few Order. shoes here, don't we? <laughs> As Justin Siegel will proudly tell you, Littles is one of the country's top independent shoe stores. I am fourth generation in the shoe business, so I would say that if you probably looked at my DNA under a microscope, you'd see little shoelaces and pumps and heels and all kinds of different shoes. People's kids have moved out, they come in, and, and the first place they go, they don't stop at home, they do not pass go and collect $200, they come straight to Littles. Or they go straight here. I'm Jerry Weber, owner of Jerry's Records in Squirrel Hill. What's up, you find anything good today? Always. People come here from out of time, West Virginia, New York, Ohio, even Philadelphia. There's no big record stores there. They come from all over the world, actually. For almost 40 years, Jerry's been buying and selling vinyl. We have over, way over a million here. We have about 800,000 45s, and then we have probably two or three or 400,000 albums. I've never really counted them. But I also have a warehouse, and I have another million in there. I stock stuff that nobody else would even bother with, like ethnic music and classical and opera and gospel music. I like it all. When you're finished thumbing through all those albums, mosey down the hall into Whistling Willie's 78s, the store owned by Jerry's son. I gave him the room a year and a half ago. He had like 578s. Now he has 70,000 of them over there. It's one of the only stores in the eastern United States in 78s. And right next to him is Galaxy Electronics. I'm kind of half afraid to sell it because it's so old. Away from the hustle and bustle of Forbes and Murray, you can join Marika Hecht. She's Director of Education with the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. 
What makes Squirrel Hill such a special neighborhood is that it has three fabulous parks flanking it. We have Frick Park, which is where we are right now, which is the largest city park. And then we also have Shenley Park and Mellon Park. We're really lucky in Pittsburgh that the kind of industrial leaders of the early 20th century had the vision to create these parks for the public. Helen Clay Frick asked her father as a gift for her 16th birthday to bequeath about 120 acres at that time to the city of Pittsburgh. The Shenley story revolves around a woman and Mary Shenley who had actually left the city of Pittsburgh but was convinced to give her land to the city on behalf of all of our residents. Mellon Park is actually the backyard of the Mellon Estate. Frick Park is legendary for its blue slide built into the side of a hill. For decades, children have been coming here. It's so famous that local rapper turned national recording artist Mac Miller wrote a song about it. Blue Slide Park, that is the official name, and I think if it wasn't, everyone would call it that anyway. In the summer, you can listen to live music at Bach, Beethoven, and Brunch at Mellon, watch the vintage Grand Prix winding through Shenley, or visit the dog park at Frick. Parks improve the quality of life for people, without a doubt. They improve your property values, but they really just improve your experience as a city resident. So Squirrel Hill's very lucky. Good schools, public and private, great housing options, tree-lined streets providing an oasis in the city. A changing population, but a neighborhood full of people who care about their home. It's like an old-style neighborhood that still has all the amenities that you can walk to, and I think a lot of people still enjoy that. I just have very fond memories of Squirrel Hill over the years. I think of it as a very diverse community, and I really think of it as actually the word community, and I would use a capital C. That's Squirrel Hill in a nutshell. If you want to find out more, come stroll the streets for yourself.